generally, um, there's two main processes that I go through when I'm hacking a person. Either I'm helping them or they're helping me. That's as simple as I can explain it. Wow. Um, but I have to come up with a pretext that falls into one of those two categories. And when I'm hacking them, I'm definitely leveraging my neuroscience and my behavioral psychology background to understand what makes people uh, tick. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. Hi, I'm joined today by Rachel Toback. Rachel, thank you for joining us. So excited to be here. Thanks, Sam. Uh, now, you're the CEO for, uh, for Social Proof Security and a hacker, and I think you may best be known for social engineering. Uh, in general, all dimensions of it. Uh, maybe I could start with sort of how did you get into security to begin with, the, the sort of the broad 30,000 foot view? Sure. I got my start in the DEF CON social engineering capture the flag where they put you in a glass booth in front of an audience of about 500 people, and you have to hack a real-life company target in 20 minutes. I ended up getting second place at that competition three years in a row. Very consistent. <laughs> and uh, and that's how I got started in InfoSec. Uh, I've, I've seen that. a recording of you doing that. Were you beat by the same person each of those three times, or was it diff somebody different each time? Different people every single time, yes. <laughs> and I hope you haven't seen too much of a recording because it's technically wiretapping if it's been recorded. You ah. probably saw snippets and pictures. That's about right, yeah. I haven't yeah. seen a recording. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so so you, you're hands-on, uh, you do it yourself very much. Um, but what is it about the social engineering part that what what pulled you into it? What what made it? Uh, uh, does it fascinate you? Uh, was it just easy to you? Did you did you have to study to do it? Definitely had to study to do it. But to take a step back, I have a background in neuroscience and behavioral psychology. I used to work in a rat lab, so um, totally separate from information security. Didn't even know infosec existed when I was getting my neuroscience degree, and later found out that the experiences that I have, both professionally in things like neuroscience, behaviorism, um, and also extracurricularly, things like improv and theater, ah. all work together in concert for things like hacking. And I had no idea that you could be non-technical and hack. I don't write code. So uh, I completely hack people over the phone, over email, uh, text message, or social media without any code. And um, I had no idea that that was going to be possible, you know, when I first heard about it. But my husband said, hey, I think you're going to be pretty good at this because you always call up our uh, service providers and get the bills lowered every month. So I, I think love you that. probably hack people over the phone. I'm terrible at that. I, I get my wife to do it all the time. I'm like, honey, I, I've got to be mean to someone. So I, I have to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, let me let me put it this way. Um, when you When you set out to hack someone, do you do research on them first or do you totally go off what they're saying in real time? I'm definitely always doing research before I hack somebody. OSINT, open source intelligence, is going to be the first step to every single engagement that I do. Um, and just to be clear, I always get consent before I go ahead and hack people. I, I, only, uh, I only do ethical hacking and white hat hacking, as some people call it. But um, yeah, somebody will say, hey, we're interested in you hacking this organization or we want you to hack me or so on and so forth. And then I'll do my OSINT. Uh, I will look up everything that I can find about them publicly available, whether that's on social media, blog posts, customer success stories, et cetera. And then that's how I decide on my pretexts, who I'm pretending to be. And do you bring the neuroscience in? Are you, are you looking for very specific, like deep animal lizard brain type responses or is it... Um is it more, uh, is it high level sort of human interaction you're riffing off the person or are you looking to actually trigger like a fight or flight response or something like that? I love that question. Um, I would say it's not fight or flight because I never scare people. That's a, 
important part of what I do in hacking. It's I can hack people without ever making them feel fear. Generally, um, there's two main processes that I go through when I'm hacking a person. Either I'm helping them or they're helping me. That's as simple as I can explain it. Wow. Um, but I have to come up with a pretext that falls into one of those two categories. And when I'm hacking them, I'm definitely leveraging my neuroscience and my behavioral psychology background to understand what makes people uh, tick, what's persuasive to them based on their interests. And knowledge of that plus Cialdini's principles of persuasion Mm -hmm. Um, really helps me understand how to set up things like time boxes under a sense of urgency. That's one of the principles of persuasion. And knowing that our amygdala, uh, the emotional center of our brain, reacts faster than the rational portions of our brain means I can hijack that process to get them to respond or um, do something faster than they typically would if I asked them something that didn't trigger that emotional center. So you, you start with helping them And then you flip it to them helping you by using two or three techniques in combination? It's more so that it either falls into one of those two camps. So Ah. either I'm helping them or they're helping me. What I mean by that is in terms of uh, me helping them, I might say something like, hey, my name is Ashley. I'm with the IT team. I just got uh, Anthony all set up and good to go with an update on his computer. So Sam, this shouldn't take you more than two seconds. Um, are, you at your, are, you, are you at your laptop right now? And you'd be like, sure, yeah, how can I help? And I'll say, awesome, bottom right-hand corner, see that little yellow shield? Can you go ahead and right-click on that for me? Right, I'm uh-huh. walking you through a process. I'm helping you. I'm trying to find out information about your a- AV or something like that. Um, but from a you helping me perspective, I might assume a pretext where I need support from you. I might say, uh, hey, Sam, brand new. Anthony, just let me know that I should contact you. I'm supposed to gain access to the deck for next week. Um, I'm really stressed out. Sorry, it's my first week. Something like that. And now you're helping me. That's the two yeah. examples. Have, um, have you found anybody resists it well? Or is everybody pretty much equally susceptible? Is it, is it something that somebody can train themselves to resist your powers for evil? Or is there something that people who do resist it have in common or who don't have in common? Yes. I would say there's definitely a group of people who have learned to be skeptical and resistant of these types of things. Um, first, at a high level, folks who are in positions of power or um, they have a lot of access or sensitive access are much harder for me to hack in general. Of course, there's always Mm. edge cases, but folks like, um, let's say a VP at an organization, been there a while, really well-trained, you know, hears about cybersecurity awareness all the time, has gotten fished before and has learned from it. That person's going to be a little bit more skeptical. The phrase that I use to describe that is being politely paranoid. They've just seen it all. And now they, they definitely don't want to fall for it again. Folks that are a little greener, a little newer to the space, maybe haven't encountered something like this before, are a little easier to trick in the beginning. But once they get used to it and understand how this stuff works, they can spot it later in their lives or later in their experience. So I would say everybody is susceptible when they don't understand what's going on or if they don't have the technical tools to protect them. So we can get into the technical tools and all that. But I I never say that it's just awareness. It's always awareness plus technical tools to back people up when they make mistakes. Right. And, and, but I love, I love in particular the fact that you brought a totally different toolkit to this than most of us think is the typical cyber quote person, right? That they went through a CS degree or a, an infosec degree and then they specialized and then they did, they practiced uh, either defense or, off, or, or offensive certified ethical hacking, for instance, for a couple right. of years. Um, do you, you know, we talk a lot about having a talent gap in our industry. Do you, do you think there's a lot of potential cyber people out there who just don't know they're cyber people or that they could be? Or is, is there, are there other Rachels out there who are just waiting for the moment to be brilliant in what we do? I like this question. Yeah. Um, I actually think that the talent gap is a fallacy. I think this is something that we believe because our recruiting practices are, there's, there's a problem. There's an mm. error somewhere in that process that we have haven't quite debugged. Um, I think there are many people who are waiting for jobs here that have not received their offer. A lot of talent already here, a lot of diverse folks that maybe uh, people don't realize that their background could be super 
uh, well positioned to add a new lens or perspective to the team. And I think once people understand that backgrounds like mine are really effective in this cybersecurity world, we should hopefully open up and widen our lens and think about who is in that pool and get more of those folks in here. I don't think we have a talent yeah. shortage. I think we have a recruiting <clears throat> and misunderstanding problem. You know, it almost worries me more to think that the attackers won't, wouldn't hesitate to recruit somebody from a non-traditional background and use them for this. And yet we're sitting there going to our recruiting officers, hey, does she have two years of experience doing this? Or what's her technical <laughs> degree in? It's like, oh, come on, really? What certs do they have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. My, my, my boss puts it well. He says, um, diversity is a competitive advantage. It's not just the right thing to do, but getting people from all these different walks of life makes us richer in defense. So uh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. It's it's a it's a massive competitive advantage because the more different types of people that you have in your organization protecting your organization, uh, the more they represent the criminals in this sphere. Right? We have criminals on on one side that are extremely diverse. We need to have all the defenders and the offense, the the offense, like the the red teamer folks. They have to match uh, mm -hmm. and have those same capabilities on both sides. So. We have to have diversity. It's absolutely essential. It's not just a check the box thing. It's actually going to make your company better. Yeah, we, we, it is fundamentally human to human conflict, at least not yet really human to machine or, or machine to human uh, or even machine to machine. Um, uh, do you have any advice for CISOs out there, uh, men or women who are thinking, how do I get more resilient against Rachel and the person she's, she's emulating or acting, pretending to be? Any advice for them on, on how to engage here? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm sure CISOs are pretty well acquainted to the concept of bringing technical tools to the table to protect your organization. I think a lot of people probably expect me to say you need more security awareness. I would say you do need security awareness, but it's not the only thing that you need. You have to have technical tools to back you up because security awareness can only get you so far. I can make people super aware, but if I spend 10 hours developing a spearfish for you, I guarantee you somebody's going to click, right? It's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when. And so we have to have those technical tools to back us up. Um, making sure that we have things like multi-factor authentication on all accounts. Uh, people are not reusing their passwords. They're stored in a password manager. They understand how to use it. Um, if people are super paranoid. They can always talk to me about my salting password manager trick that I really like to talk about. What's that? Say more about that. <laughs> yeah, for salting sure. Salting the password manager? You mean you put some in there that are like dummy passwords that are like canary in a coal mine or they just... That'd be cool, but no, that's not what I'm talking about. So I hear a lot of people say, well, we don't want our people using password managers. What if they get breached? First of all, I'd say it's encrypted. We, it's mm. unlikely that you're going to have those passwords be a problem unless there's some sort of credential harvesting fish that affects those password manager folks. Um, but you need to have unique passwords for every single account. And a lot of times people say, well, I don't want to store those in one place. It's like putting all my eggs in one basket. And I'm politely paranoid, so I get that. It's very unlikely that we can break in encryption, right? That's not something that we're seeing right now. It's not the biggest threat. Um, I'd say the bigger threat is reusing your passwords. But let's live in a world where we're super paranoid and we're uncomfortable with storing them. I would say, according to your threat model, probably going to want to use a password manager. Go ahead and choose a password manager. And then from there, you can have a little code that only you know that's not stored in the password manager. Mm. So every single account has their own password. You have a special code, you know where it goes. Maybe it goes two characters from the last character, for instance, and it's a six character code, for instance. Um, and you're gonna go ahead and put that in. And let's say an attacker breached your password manager, which again, I don't think is possible, but if they did, they still can't use them. That is brilliant. Uh, so. Yeah, my, I mean, my dad does something similar, and I don't want to out him here, but he takes the he takes some of the spelling of whatever the service is and layers that in, in a way it's that fun, only he yeah. knows. Yeah, he he tries to find ways of salting, but I've been still trying to convince him to use a password manager for years. He still has the the traditional notebook tucked away in in, in a. In you a know what? Case. You you might have seen oh. me talk about this on Twitter before. I I talk about this all the time, but. Uh, according to your threat model, I'm completely fine with people using a, a notebook. You know, is is their threat model such that uh, a break in is going to be happening imminently? If not, then I would say store it in a notebook in a lockbox somewhere. You're probably just fine. Now, if you are, it's a password manager. It's just totally. a mechanical one. Yeah, 
Exactly. You know, if you're Kim Kardashian, maybe that's not the best move, right? Because she experienced some break-ins and issues like that. And you're probably going to want to store things in a different way. But if you're not Kim Kardashian or a high level senator or somebody who's a celebrity in the public eye, I'd say go for it. That's probably just fine for your threat model. Uh, and, and we're running out of time here. Uh, do you have a, uh, any final advice for somebody who's potentially out there going, did you really mean it? Am I, am I really sort of cyber material? Anything you would recommend? Uh, it could be a movie, a book, a piece of advice, a famous quote, anything that you would say to that person? Oh, yeah. I'd say if you're not sure if you want to get into human hacking in any way, watch the movie Sneakers. And if at the end of that movie you think, yeah, I could do something like that, then join us. That's a good one. All right. Rachel, thank you so much for being with me today and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason. End cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.